Amen. Amen. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. As we see, there's a lot of prayer requests, and also when you uh, watch the news and the turmoil around the world, and things going on in our country and in our local communities, it's easy to get discouraged. I want you to know that Peter, when he wrote this epistle, was um, a little, it was right when the great persecution was coming against the church. So they were looking at hostile times ahead, there was hostile times at hand. This would be one of the great purges that Caesar Nero put out on the church, and Peter would actually be killed during it, and so would Paul. So they were no stranger to adversity, and you can't walk through this world without um, having that kind of adversity that comes upon you. So this is written specifically for us, our, our time and day. Before we get into that, I'd just like to say that on May 21st, which is three weeks from now, we're going to have a potluck at the same time. After the potluck, there's going to be a bike blessing in the, um, in the parking lot. We're going to have a, some motorcycles out there and have them blessed. Um, CMA is going to come and do a presentation, which is a motorcycle association. And then there's going to be a bike run after that. At the same day, a guy named David Holmbrecht is coming, and he's going to do an evangelistic kind of outreach thing. If any of you would like to know better how to share your faith, I think as a congregation, our philosophy is not to uh, necessarily have evangelistic programs because I believe that healthy sheep produce sheep. That when people are healthy in the Lord and they're growing in the Lord and they're full of God's grace, that they would naturally reach out to the people around them, their neighbors, their friends, their family, um, and their jobs. But a lot of times we want to reach out to the people around us, but we don't have the tools to do that. We don't know exactly how to do that. So it would seem awkward. Um, <coughs> something that he him and I talked about, he and I talked about, was something that he was introducing me to it, and I used it for years myself because I'd heard of it. It's when you're talking to someone and you say, what's the greatest thing that ever happened to you? What's the best thing that ever happened to you? And they'll tell you, and then they you say, the best thing that ever happened to me was, and you can go on and tell them about meeting the Lord and the way that, what he's done in your life and how he's changed relationships and things like that. Just very um, seamless and um, natural ways to share your faith with other people. So that's going to be on May 21st. That class will be at 3 o'clock. The bike lessons will be right after the, the service, and their presentation will be during the service. So just to put those things on your radar. As we look at um, at 1 Peter, we go back to chapter 2, and it, what he talks about first is the kind of the sphere of government, that we're supposed to be submissive to the government so we can be examples for Christ. Then he talks about the sphere of our employment, what we do for a living, how we make money, how we make our living, that we should be submissive in that way. And, and the, the thing is, is, when it talks about submission, it's not talking about being a doormat, it's talking about you're submissive to the, to the structure that God has put in place, the authority that God has put in place. And rather than being a rebel, that we're honorable, and we're respectable, and we're loving, and we're kind. And that if we're treated poorly in these systems of the world, how does the world react when they're treated poorly? Well, they respond in kind. They respond poorly themselves. And that's not how Christians are supposed to act. That being full of grace, that we react better than any given situation requires. And that makes us honorable people and respectable people, not because those things deserve honor and respect, but because that's who we are, that we're representing Christ. As we, and then we turn those situations, adversity, we turn adversity around and make it something that is a positive. And Peter could speak to that because Peter had been run out of Rome. He's over in Galatia, which is modern-day Turkey, and he's writing these letters to the, to the Jews and the believers who've been scattered around the world. So he's saying, how can you act in ways that still win the world when the world is going south? So in the third chapter, it starts out, in the same way or likewise, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives 
will speak to them without any words. They'll be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Don't be concerned about the outward beauty or fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourself instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, <coughs> which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They trusted God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For an instance, Sarah obeyed her husband, Abraham called obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master. You are the daughter, you are her daughters, when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. Now, when we get to this passage, a lot of pastors or teachers will cringe at this because it goes counterculture. It's like, and, and so I've heard a lot of guys say, well, we're stupid and they're smart, and it's like, that's not necessary. What's necessary to understand is that God has established order in the world. And that by being submissive to a situation, to marriage, or being submissive to your husbands, I want you to note that all of these situations, all these spheres of authority, nowhere does it say that there's an absolute obedience to the authority over you. It is the authority that God has given in a situation. So if the government tells us to do something against God's word, what do we say? No. No, no we're not doing that. Respectfully, honorably, we <coughs> do it. Out of respect, we say, no, we can't do that. The same way in a job, same way in a marriage relationship, same way in a child relationship. Um, you're not under any obligation to go against the supreme authority, which is God. But within those, within those um, areas of, whether it's the church, the sphere of the church, or the sphere of the family, the Lord has put it in place that men should be in authority. And men should be leaders. And it should come to this no shock that as men are not authorities and not leaders in those areas, those things have failed. Uh, the failure of our society is that men have not been men. And men need to step up and be men. And they need to be encouraged in that also. Um, not because, and again, again, not because they're better. There's an equality here is talked about. And the best way I can describe it is says that women are the weaker vessel. And you said, boy, that doesn't sound good at all. But it, it is just a fact that physically women are weaker than men. I mean, if you take something like running, well, that stuff doesn't take a lot of strength. There's like about 2,000 men who have run under a four-minute mile. And I think women, like, I think their record is four minutes and 20 seconds. There's high school boys that have run four-minute miles, or less than four-minute miles. And it's just a physical thing that men and women are not the same physically. Um, that doesn't mean that there's less value there. I can tell you this, um, if you take the most expensive violins in the world, they're called Stradivariuses. And they're fine instruments. Um, they don't give those to beginner students, you know why? They're fragile. They're weaker. They give them things that look like violins. We call them violin-shaped objects. <laughs> you put a nail in pound it. You can pound a nail in with one of them. When you start out, you have an instrument like that, but it's not very responsive. Um, I've heard it said, like, women are like champagne glasses and men are like beer mugs. <laughs> Each for their own thing, not either one equal or better, but one is weaker and one is stronger, one is more fine and one is more coarse. So God has an order in things. And when we try to upset the order of things out of a rebellious nature, it smears the name of God. When you look at this, you say, well, what about submission? Jesus Christ, for instance, didn't he make himself subject to human form? Did that make him less than God? He submitted to parents. Do you think his parents were perfect? I can tell you they were not, because they were men and women. No parents are perfect. So Jesus was under their authority. He was under the authority of the state. He was under the authority. But he was in no means was he to be under the authority of them to the detriment of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But servant leadership is what this world is, is lacking. It's a thing called toxic masculinity. Nothing can be further from the truth. I'm not saying that men have never overstepped their bounds and done a 
done a disservice to Manta by being too macho or too rough or too coarse, because obviously you can go out the wrong side of that too. But that hasn't been what's harmed society so much as men stepping back and going, not my problem. I, I, I would, but I can't. Men are supposed to take authority, take leadership in the church and in the family. And the women are supposed to support that. Like, well, what if my husband's going to make mistakes? What if, you know, because sometimes some guys out there make mistakes. <laughs> um, you can't, this is, a, this is a philosophy of our church too, you can't expect people to grow in leadership roles if you don't allow them to make mistakes. If you micromanage people, they won't make mistakes, they'll just learn to look at you all the time. Can I do this? Can I do that? And they won't develop as a leader. If, if you say, you say, how should I do this? How should I do that? How should I do the other? You say, figure it out. I trust you. Well, won't they make mistakes? Well, I sure hope so. That's how I learn. That's how you learn. Not that you would not receive counsel, but that people would grow in the areas that God has given them and learn through their mistakes. So, it says that they trusted God and accepted this authority as their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master. Now, I've tried to really pound this verse into Angie's head. <laughs> <laughs> but so far, no luck. She's not calling him master. I said, okay, use the shortened version. How about mister? <laughs> no. <laughs> But it says that he, she called him master because she was without fear of what her husband might do. Because you don't have to, ladies, trust your husband implicitly. You can trust God in your husband. That if your husband makes a mistake, that God will make it right by you. In the meantime, he'll grow. That's what Sarah was saying because if you look at Abraham, her husband... When they went into a strange and foreign place, he said, hey, you're pretty good looking. Why don't I pretend like you're my sister? That way they won't kill me. And she goes, well, what about me? <laughs> she got taken into a harem. And God intervened in that. She learned after a while that I don't necessarily have to trust this guy to always make the right decision. But I've learned to trust God that he can make it right by me. And that's how I'm with the government or a job or anywhere else in life. I can say, I'll surrender this situation to the Lord. Um, I've heard it said before, the best revenge is living well. That you say, okay, I'll take the wrong. I'll remain with the right frame of mind with honor, respect, and dignity. And I'll trust God to work this out for me. And God has over and over again. I've never been shortchanged handing things over to God and saying, could you handle that for me? Because I just want to get even. I just want. I just want to stick up for myself. I just. I just don't want to absorb this injustice. And God is very faithful to do that. So I'm not telling you to trust your husbands implicitly. I'm saying trust the process that God has put him in charge because he's supposed to be in charge. And when you put that weight of responsibility on him, he might grow up. He might learn. He might become a better leader. Whereas if you're constantly fighting, he might just back off and go, Well, you can't allow. I'll be out with my man cave. I'll be out with my buddies. I'll be doing this. I'll be doing that. I'll be doing anything but being around here. You got to come. And that's what I see men doing oftentimes in our society is checking out because they don't want to have that responsibility of leading. And quite frankly, the world has told them, you, know, you shouldn't. You're not any good at this anyways. You're not very smart. You're not very sensitive. If you just become like a woman, then you'd be grown up. And that's not the case. God wants women to be women and men to be men. So verse 7, it says, In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She might be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. 
So a man must give his wife honor as they live together. And he must treat her as an equal partner. Um, many times, you know, men will say, I, I've heard men say, well, in Corinthians it says we're to treat our wives like Christ treats the church. Well, that's impossible, so I give up. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Now, we just like write off Jesus, like, well, that was Jesus, he could do that, I can't. But he was an example to us so that we would be like him. And when it says to be like Christ is the church, what that means is, what do you think Jesus' focus is on the world right now? The church. What does he move through? The church. How does he work things through the church? That is his mechanism on this world to get his work done in this world. He is concentrating on nurturing, growing up, teaching the church. Many times men will say, I'm just trying to do enough to keep my to get my wife off my case so I can do what I want to do. <laughs> what a shame. Is that what Jesus is, is that how Jesus teach, treats his body? His bride. Does he go, I oh, quit bugging me. What do you want? Okay, if I do those three things, can I go do what I want? No, his focus is on the church. And our focus needs to be on our wives, to honor them, to respect them, to grow them in the Lord, to nurture them, so they can become what God wants them to be. And you can see why this relationship is mutual, where a woman is supporting her husband so he can become what God wants him to be, and vice versa. That way, in my relationship, my focus isn't on me, it's on my wife. And her focus isn't on her, it's on me. Because Christianity in itself is selfless. Love is taking you out of the equation and putting the other person in, the, in that place. That is Christianity. In, verse, in um, verse 8 it says, Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do. He will bless you for it. This is, um, a lot of times people have a specialized <coughs> teachings for marriage. You know, like husbands do this and wives do this. I would say if you're having problems in your marriage, just punt and go back to the position of, what if this were just somebody who's another Christian? If they're just a Christian, I should be of one mind with them. I should sympathize with them. I should love them as a brother or sister. I should be tender-hearted. I should keep a humble attitude. I should not repay evil for evil. Wouldn't that make a lot of relationships just a lot better? If we just treated treated our spouses like strangers and the fact that we give them common courtesy. In the Bible, there's countless numbers of one another verses. And I always use the one another verses to, I usually use these verses to push, um, exalt, promote the church. You can't do one another verses by yourself. Right? You have to do one another verses in a group of people. And that's the local body. So we're supposed to be at peace with one another. We're supposed to wash one another's feet. It says over dozens of times in the Bible to love one another, to be devoted to one another, to honor people above ourselves, to live in harmony with one another, to pass judgment on one another, accept each other as Christ accepted. I mean, the list goes on and on about how we're supposed to treat each other. And all these things are selfless, and all these things are to encourage and grow us in the Lord. And that's what we're, that's what my goal is towards you. That's what your goal should be towards the people around you, is that you're encouraging them to grow up in the Lord through nurturing and care. So the same would be said as all Christians, as your husbands and wives, as your children, the same way with the government, the same way with your employment. Now what's interesting is he switches into a thing here, Peter does, of Psalm 34. Psalm 34 starts in uh, verse 10 and goes down through verse 12. He takes a quote out of there. 
He might have learned this when he was in Hebrew school or something, like, this is how you're supposed to act. Like, this is the just good basic rules for, for human behavior, how to be happy in life. What's interesting is David wrote the psalm when he was running for his life from Saul. Saul wanted to kill David because David had been anointed king of Israel. And Saul was the current king. And if you're the current king and someone gets anointed king, what do you think? Unemployment, right? Or jealousy, or rage. And so he said, I need to kill David so I can remain king. So he started chasing him all over the countryside. And David went into the Philistines, acted like he was insane, ended up living with the, with the Philistines, basically, so that he could survive this terror that Saul was bringing on him. And in the middle of this psalm, or in the middle of this terror reign, he wrote this psalm. It was how to be happy when you're under tribulations and trials, basically. And I think that when we look at, at like we said, the prayer requests of people, healing of difficult life situations, of the world we live in, of, a, of we, as we see things happening around us, how are we supposed to act? In the verse 10 it says, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. So watch what you say. The next one says, turn away from evil and do good. There you go, there's something to do, right? Turn away from evil, do good. The next thing, search for peace. And then work to maintain it. Search for peace. And then work to maintain it. It says, the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. And his ears are open to their prayers, but the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Isn't that good practical advice? Mm -hmm. These, and you'll notice they're all proactive words because the Bible teaches strongly that salvation is of the Lord. That our souls are saved because Christ died on the cross. There's nothing we can do to earn salvation. I can't do anything to make God love me anymore or love me any less. His love is unconditional because He is love. Right? And I'm one of the objects of His love, and I've received that for myself. You say, well, now what? What's my part? Your part? Keep your tongue from speaking evil. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace. And work hard to maintain it. Now, who will want to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. So it's like, who's going who's gonna to try to hurt someone who's doing good in the world? Well, usually we don't get in trouble because of doing good in the world, do we? I've never gotten in trouble for doing good. I got in trouble a lot, but usually I brought it upon myself. And usually it was a long time coming, and I didn't get as bad as I deserved. But some people are, some people are, and we will in the future, if things continue on their trajectory, we will suffer for doing what is right. And sometimes that can make us afraid, can't it? What if, and you hear all the new scenarios coming down the track, you know, they're planning this and they're planning that and they're planning the other, right? What's the, when you hear those things, what is the tone of that? Hopeful? Dreadful? Afraid? I want to read you something. I, I came across this a while back, and it just seems like something that's so relevant to our day. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 11. You should mark this down. I'll write it down if you take notes. Isaiah 8, 11 says, The Lord has given me a strong warning not to think like everyone else does, he said. So don't think like everyone else does. Don't call everything a conspiracy like they do. And don't live in dread of what frightens them. Make the Lord of Heaven's army holy in your life. He is the one you should fear. He is the one who should make you tremble. We should not fear the world. We should fear the Lord. He will keep you safe. But to Israel and Judah, 
He'll be a stone that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many will stumble, never to rise again. They will be snared and captured. So since the Lord is in charge, should we be afraid? No. Should we go around saying, conspiracy, they're out to get us? No. Oh my! No, we don't need to fall into that trap. Instead, it tells us here in verse 16, it says, preserve the teaching of God. That's why this feels like a sanctuary. Because we're not going to read into all that other stuff. We're going to go, let's have the clear teaching of God. Entrust his instructions to those who will follow me. We instruct people who listen, right? The third thing is, is I will wait for the Lord who has turned away from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my hope in him. God's prescription for turmoil and trouble is simple. <laughs> Keep in your mind, the front of your mind, always on, the, on your lips, who's in charge. I know how the story ends. I know my Redeemer lives. I will fear the one who is in charge of heaven's armies. I'm not going to get caught up. And like I said, it's easy to get caught up in that, isn't it? Why? Because it's real. It's happening. It's in your face. They're not hiding it. So you're like, well, then I should fear, right? No. You can be aware. So I asked me, so what are you going to do? Just do nothing? I'm like, no. Okay. I've made preparations <coughs> to figure out what... I've made preparations long enough to figure out how it's all going to work. That's right. <laughs> I, you can't prepare long enough if they're going to do this indefinitely. Right? Mm -hmm. There's no bomb shelter big enough. There's no canned goods high enough. There's no machine gun strong enough. There's just no way. So what do you do? Right. Just... Be wise. Be wise enough to see things coming and go, let me, be, let me have enough margin here where I can figure out what's going on so I can help out other people and so that I'm not afraid. I'm not, I ain't scared. That's what we say now. Because I know who's in charge of all this. So he says, so don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. Did you know Jesus is Lord of your life? I've heard preachers before say, make Jesus Lord of your life. I'm not going to do that this morning because you know what? He already is, whether you like it or not. <laughs> some, some preachers will say, you need to become a disciple of Jesus. I'm like, no, I'm not going to say that because you already are. How good you are or not, that's, that's a debatable question. How well are you doing that? How much are you acknowledging his lordship? If you haven't acknowledged that Jesus is lord of your life, then you've been confused a lot. You've been in turmoil a lot. You've had a lot of friction in your life because you haven't figured out who's in charge yet. Once you figure out who's in charge, it's a lot easier. Once you figure out who to be afraid of, it's a lot easier. Be afraid of the Lord, not about the people around you. If someone asks about your Christian faith, your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle, respectful way. Keep your conscience clear that if people speak against you, they will be ashamed. And they will see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. So it says, always be ready to tell people about the hope that is within you. Well, first of all, you have to live a life that makes people go, why do you act like that? And I don't mean in a weird, strange way. I don't mean in like that, what's wrong with you? Like my grandpa used to say. Right, sakes, what's the matter with you? <laughs> I can still remember him saying it. Um, that's kid stuff, he'd say. Well, but I'm a kid, grandpa. <laughs> he meant grow up. But when someone asks you, why do you have this great expectation? Why do you have this hope? Why are you not in dread? Why are you not fearful? You need to have something ready to say. I mean, I'll just be honest. I've, I've blown it over and over again with this. I used to go around happy all the time. I used to do deliveries and just smiling happy, you know, just having a good time because I was getting like money for nothing. It was just an easy job, right? You're always happy. I'd say, 
How can I not be happy when my hair is so nappy? <laughs> <laughs> no, wait a second. I'm wasting a lot of opportunities here. I'd say, well, I know how the story ends. What do you mean by that? I know the yada yada yada. I'm going to die and go to heaven. Oh, really? Are you a believer? Yeah. I, I believe that my, my future is secure so I can enjoy the present. Wow. What religion are you? Not a religion. I just go with the Bible. What the Bible says. I find religion to be a distraction. Oh, me too. I'm more spiritual. Well, what do you base your spirituality on? And then you can start conversations. So if you're thinking about this and people are going, why are you different? You can sit back in your bed at night going, hmm, what can I answer that? So I'm ready to give everybody an answer for the hope that lies within me. First of all, you have to have a hope that lies within you. If you're sitting back in your bed at night going, oh no, they're going to get me. <laughs> they're going to get me, I can't. They're going to take away my kids. They're going to. That's not. People are going to look at you and go, why are you afraid like the rest of us? You say you're a Christian. But when they ask about the hope that lies within you, you need to be ready to give them an answer. And it's so funny because it's, <laughs> it's like the Bible anticipates uh, how we're going to answer because it says in verse 16, but, but do this with a gentle and respectful way. Why do you think they put that in there? I don't think Christians are always so gentle or respectful, do you? Because we're going to heaven and you're going to hell, that's why. <laughs> I figured it out. We're a dummy. I, I know we don't say those things ever, right? <laughs> but sometimes when I listen to Christian apologists, and there's a lot of them now on reels and in different snippets, Instagram and stuff, you can see it, and it comes across really sanctimonious and self-righteous that I'm really smart and you're really dumb. But really, I'm a sinner and I needed Jesus. And so do you. Doesn't that sound different? Mm -hmm. I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind and now I see. You can see too. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live in pain. You don't have to live in heartache. You can know that there's a hope. That's a different message than how could you be so stupid? April 1st is the National Atheist Day. Huh? You know, it feels good. It's like we're all neat, but it's not. It's like, but it doesn't do any good for the kingdom of God. It's egotistical. So we have to do it in a way that is gent gentle and respectful. <coughs> so that the only offense that you want people to have is the clear gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know what I mean by that when I say the gospel should be the only offense? That you say it in such a way that you're like, well, you're not offensive, and the way you said it wasn't offensive, but I don't like that Jesus is the only way. That is the goal. I mean, you don't want them to reject the gospel, obviously. <coughs> you want to present it in a way, in an attractive way, in a relevant way, so that they can accept it. But if they reject it, you don't want it to be because you were a jerk. Or they felt like they had to lose to you to accept the gospel. And when it comes to communication, um, there's this little ratio I learned recently. And that's that when you communicate with somebody, um, this might explain something to some people because it did to me. People only listen, ten, less than 10% is the word you actually say. Did you know that? Less than 10% is content. Less than 40% is your tone. So like 38% is your tone of voice. So it's not what you said, it's how you said it. What's the other part? Body language. Now, for me, that was very offensive because like I said the right things. I didn't lie. I said it exact, but I didn't say it with the right tone. And I didn't say it with the right body language. Communication has a lot to do with, are you smiling when you say it, or are you frowning when you say it? Do you look like you hate me, or do you look like you love me? Do you look like you're concerned with my welfare, or do you look like you're, you're just happy to get this little check my box? So less than 10% is content, less than 40% is tone, and over 50% is your body language. And that's like... If and this, I've said this before, sorry to be redundant, but if you spend your week railing against people who are unsafe, when you get ready to talk to someone who's unsafe, they're going to know that you don't like them. 
They will see it, they will smell it, they will feel it with every pore. I don't care what we're... Well, I love you. I'm just worried about your soul and look at you doing. Yeah, you love me, I can tell you do. <laughs> now, your body language doesn't say you love me. Your tone doesn't say you love me. Your tone is patting me on the head like this. With respect and with dignity, we treat other human beings. Hope, hoping to win them, being winsome. I don't mean watering down the gospel. The gospel is the gospel. We are all sinners bound for hell without the blood of Jesus Christ. Period. That never changes. But the way you say it, how you say it, when you say it, is it said out of love and compassion? Or is it said out of, well, that's another one on my list. He says, um, remember it is better to suffer for doing good if it is what God wants us to do than suffer for doing wrong. Sometimes it's better that we suffer. When we have prayer requests for healing and for health things, it's good that we are healed. And it's good that our health is resolved through the power of Jesus Christ. But sometimes it's better that we suffer. Did you know that? So in the suffering, we say, in the suffering, how can I serve you better? Paul said that when he was in prison. He goes, I want to find out, not a way to get out of prison, I want to find a way to better articulate the gospel of Jesus Christ to people. And that's the Apostle Paul. So, it's great to pray for healing, and I think healing is great, and I believe in supernatural healing. But healing is not the end goal. The end goal is the kingdom of God. In verse 18 it says, Christ suffered for our sins once, once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring them safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in the terrible flood. So he's saying, Jesus Christ, and this is a, uh, if you want to do a deep dive into this sometime, you can. It says that he went, that Christ went and preached to the, to the spirits in prison. So what does that mean? Well, if you look in the, um, in Luke's Gospel, he talks about the rich man and Lazarus. How they went to Sheol, some people call it Hades, or hell. And in that place was two compartments. The bosom of Abraham, and a place of great torment. And Lazarus, the rich man, was in a great place of great torment. And uh, Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom. He was comforted, the other guy was tormented. What do you think happened to the saints in the Old Testament who believed in the Lord, followed his ways, Believed in Jehovah, but they couldn't accept Jesus because Jesus wasn't there yet, right? So where did they go? Well, they went to this place. It's like a holding place. And it says here that Jesus went down and preached to those people. And he led captivity captive. He, he set the captives free. So basically, he conquered death. And by believing in him, they were saved. And obviously, they wouldn't believe in him because they were waiting for him, right? Now, how that theologically plays out, and who could accept him and who could not, and who was he preaching to? <laughs> you figure it out. <laughs> I like to say I don't know every now and then. I don't know. What I do know is, is that when Jesus died, he completely died. And he descended to the very depths of hell. He experienced it all for you and I. It is finished. It is complete. He experienced that kind of anguish, that kind of torment, that kind of problems and difficulties for what? For you. The question is, will you do the same? Will you be Christ-like? Will you go through your torments and your trials and your troubles for the betterment of the people around you? Will you be Christ-like? It says in that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you. Not by the removing of dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, some people have taken that verse to mean uh, what, what the theological term would call it, 
baptismal regeneration. In other words, you have to be baptized to be saved. Well, that's not true. I mean, I just give you what about the thief on the cross? Was he baptized? What it's talking about is in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, it says that we are baptized by one spirit into the body of Christ. That you are born again, that you return, that your eternal soul is regenerated at the time of salvation. You're baptized into the body of Christ. Now, the physical baptism is a symbol of what's going on inside of you. If you've been saved, we believe in adult immersion. Like when you've been saved and you've accepted Christ as your Savior, then we dunk down in the water and go, there you are. Now, you can get dunk all you want. If you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior and be regenerated, I don't care how many times we dunk you, how many ways we do it, how many, you're not going to get saved. Because all you get is wet, right? But once you have accepted Christ, once you have been baptized into his body, then what you're doing is publicly declaring in the ceremony, I'm one of yours. Now, some people say, well, it's just a ceremony. It's not just a ceremony. Jesus Christ did it. He goes to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist says, you should be baptizing me, not me baptizing you. He says, we must do this so that all things will be fulfilled. Why? Because he wanted to identify and he wanted to give us an example. So he's instructed us, asked us, told us to become baptized when we are saved. You say, well, it doesn't mean that much to me. Well, I'll tell you this. If you go to India, there's a, a law against, what's the word, proselytizing. What? Well, I've never proselytized in my life. I'll never do that. What does that mean? <laughs> It means convert somebody from one faith to another. And you can talk all you want. And you can um, get someone to believe whatever you want them to believe. And they're not so bad with that. You know what they're really upset about? When you start baptizing people into the Christian faith, they'll come for you. They will persecute you. Because now you are demonstrably converting someone from one thing to another. And that's like, so they say, well, does it, do I have to get baptized to be saved? Well, I'm absolutely not. It's like someone saying, well, you know, marriage is just a piece of paper. It's just a ceremony and a ring. You know, what does that mean? Well, if I wanted to marry a gal, I already am, so don't think about it. But <laughs> if, I, if I told Angie, I said, I want to marry you, and she said, well, I don't want to wear a ring, and I don't want a ceremony, and I don't really want it to be official, though. Mm-hmm. Don't tell anybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, well, mm-hmm. I don't think she, I don't think she knows what marriage means. Mm-hmm. I have a problem with the fact that she won't do the things that we would naturally celebrate. So if you say, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I don't want to get baptized, why? That's for you to say. So he says, and the water is a picture of baptism. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now in verse 22 it says, Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God, and all the angels and authorities and powers that accept his authority. So right now where is Jesus? In heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstools. He is exalted. <coughs> Before he was exalted, what happened? He was abased. He says, Behold, I am a worm. He became cursed for us. What phase are you in? Are you in the exalted phase yet? <laughs> we are living here on earth as representatives of Christ. So we're not going the world's going to come up and pat you on the back for being a good Christian. If it does, you can just think that's temporary because they won't think so forever. If you get any amount of, hey, that's really great. Super. Suck it up, because it won't last. Eventually, you'll be cursed for it. Eventually, and people will look down on you for it. Eventually, people say, I don't like that. Because the cross of Christ is an offense to this world. Like I said, it is the rock that they stumble on. It's the rock that divides. Jesus Christ 
sinners that won't accept Christ don't like the whole Jesus thing. Only Jesus, only grace. Religious people who you say is just Jesus and only Jesus, they don't like it either. There's a narrow way that is Jesus only and that Jesus did all the work and that we humbly accept what he did for us on the cross. That is the narrow path. And, and that will get you killed eventually. That's what got Jesus killed. Did they kill Jesus because he raised people from the dead? No. Feeding the 5,000? No. His nice teachings? His, like, why are they crucifying this guy? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. All other ways are thieves and robbers. And now the people are hey, wait a minute. I don't think I like that. The religious people said that, and the people that were rejected and were sinners. For us who understand that we stand condemned before a perfect and right God is the best news in the world. Jesus, the rock we stand on. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for um, even the trials and the pain and the trouble that Peter and the saints went through back then. Because in the middle of it, Peter was able to write that we have a great hope, a great expectation that in the end, in the life after this, it pays off. That we are to suffer and we are to, but we are to do it with fear. We're to do it with courage. We're to do it with respect. We're to do it with honor. I pray that your Holy Spirit would empower us to do that because only by your power can we respond well when people treat us poorly. Only by your power can we have productive marriages and be productive at work and keep the right attitude towards the government. It is supernatural that you'd be able to do these things in us when we give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name.